All right, so last time we finished the, uh, the sort of algebraic development of the determinant. We uh, gave a definition for a function that deserves the name determinant, and we, uh, we showed that there is a, a, a one, that it's unique, that was actually not all that hard, but then, uh, uh, excuse me, that, there, that it's unique that there's only one such function, and, and then the hard part was showing that there is one, that there exists such a function. So we did that, and we gave a formula for the determinant, the uh, permutation expansion formula. But the point we're making with the check-in here is that to actually calculate determinants, you typically don't want to use the permutation expansion formula, is that if somebody just throws a determinant at you, this one is 4 by 4, so it's big enough to be sort of annoying to do by hand. If someone throws a determinant at you, you're going to do Gauss's method. So, of course, I'm going to do that. Here we go. All right, so uh, let's see. The determinant that I wrote down is uh, 2, 1, 0, 3, 2, 1, 0, 3, 4, 2, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 2, 1, 0. All right, so I've got to find whether or not this matrix is non-singular, and I'm going to calculate the determinant, what the determinant function returns on this matrix. And uh, I don't think I've ever done this before, but it's obvious, obvious what I'm doing here. I'm going to write equals, and then I'm going to do the Gauss's method step here. So minus 2 row 1 plus row 2, just to, so that a person can go back and check and see what I did. So this is, gives me 2, 1, 0, oh, 3, 0, 0, minus 1, minus 6. And then just copy in 0, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 2, 1, 0. All right, and then the next step is the one that's of any interest at all. I would go to use that to eliminate below, but it's a zero. So, of course, I have to do a row swap. So, swap row one and row two. Two, one, oh, three. Zero, one, one, one. Zero, zero, minus one, minus six. Zero, two, one, zero. And I didn't forget, when you do a row swap, you have to change the sign, so there needs to be a minus sign there. Okay, when you do a row swap, you have to change the sign of the determinant. If I had factored out a 2, then I would have multiplied 2 times the whole determinant. I didn't do that, but when you do a row swap, you have to change the sign of the determinant as a whole. Okay, so off I go now, doing stuff that is, uh, that is not, uh, not anything new to us. So I've got to uh, use the 1 to get rid of the 2. So minus 2, row 2, add to row 4. 2, 1, 0, 3, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, minus 6, and 0, 0, minus 1, minus 2. Don't forget to carry the minus sign on to the next line. And then finally, what it's, uh, i got to use the minus 1 to get rid of the minus 1, so it's minus row 3, add to row 4, and uh, I've got here... Uh, 2, 1, 0, 3, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, minus 6, and 0, 0, 0, 4, and don't forget the minus sign. Okay, so uh, so now I have a, uh, an echelon form matrix. I'll just multiply down the diagonal, don't forget the minus sign, and I'll get the answer. So equals minus 2 times, 1 times, minus 1 times, Four times, and and when when you do it all, you get eight. Okay, so the lesson is you don't use the permutation expansion. We use it for the theory, but in practice, if somebody throws kind of an arbitrary matrix at you and asks you to find the determinant, why you want to use Gauss's method. Okay, great. Now, uh, now uh, the first section involves kind of the algebra of determinants, but uh, uh, one of the nice things about the subject of linear algebra is that there's this trade-off, there's this play-off between algebra and geometry, and so in this section we're turning to the, the, the geometry of determinants. And, uh, ge and the geometry of determinants is, uh, is, is actually kind of a lot of fun here, and it gives us a new insight into how determinant functions work. So let's, let's start in on that. So I'm going to find the determinant as a size function. In the past, when I calculated things like I did on the check-in and I got the determinant was 8, I only paid attention to whether it was 0 or not. In this section, we're going to come to understand what 8 means as opposed to 1 or 4 or 6. 
All right, so we're starting with some geometry. So I'm looking at two matrices in R2, and uh, I've, uh, I've drawn them, and I've also drawn the kind of parallelogram diagram that a person draws when they want to, to add up the two vectors. In this space in the parallelogram, this is, uh, this is a collection of points, but um, it, it's part of the span of x1, y1, and x2, y2, but it's a special part of the span of x1, y2, x1, y1, and x2, y2. Suppose I, for example, put my, put my mouse right here. It looks to me that I'm about 80% of the way up the x1, y1 vector, and about, I don't know, 20% of the way up the x2, y2 vector. That is to say, if I'm looking at this as a combination, t1 times x1, y1 plus t2 times x2, y2, I think t1 is about 0.8, where I've put my, my mouse, and t2 is about 0.2. Similarly, if I put my mouse over here, I think, I'm, I think there, t2 is about 0.9. I'm about 0.9 of the way up the, in the direction of the x2, y2 vector. But x1, y1, not so much, maybe 0.1. That is to say that this parallelogram is filled with points where if you take t1 times the first vector plus t2 times the second vector, t1 and t2 are, are, are numbers between 0 and 1. So that gives me the definition. The box, or if you're in larger dimensions, you probably call it a parallelopiped, but I have trouble spelling parallelopiped, so I go with box. The box formed by this sequence of vectors is just the collection of linear combinations of the vectors where the, the coefficients are between 0 and 1. That's just simply motivated by the picture, that's all. I'm interested, we're thinking about geometry, so I'm interested in the area of that box. So I calculated the area of that box. If I gave you, you know, as a homework problem, find the area of that box, I'm sure what you would do is you'd take out a piece of paper and you'd say to yourself, well, I have this big rectangle and I'm going to subtract away this triangle, subtract away that triangle, that triangle, that triangle, that rectangle, that rectangle. And when you subtract away all that stuff, what will be left is the area inside. So there we go. That's what exactly what I did. And what I was left with was x1 times y2 minus x2 times y1. And then the chapter on determinants, so a person right away says, well, that's the determinant of the matrix formed by the x1, y1, and x2, y2 as column vectors. That's the determinant. Well, it can't be a coincidence. It'd be pretty silly to be covering it in slides if it was a coincidence. And anyway, it isn't a coincidence. So I'm, we're going to, in this section, I'm going to think about uh, Instead of considering the determinant as a function of the rows, we're going to consider it as a function of the columns. And so we're going to state things about the determinant in, in, in terms of columns because that fits with the geometry we want, we want to do. You saw in the previous slide that I wanted to look at those vectors as columns inside the array. So restating, we know the determinant of transpose equals the determinant of the matrix. So restating the conditions in the definition of determinant in terms of transpose and at the same time reminding ourselves what are the conditions gives me this. If you do column operations, then the determinant of the matrix is unchanged. So if you take a matrix, perform k times column i plus column j, where i is unequal j, and get a new matrix a hat, then the determinant of a and the determinant of a hat are the same. Condition two, swapping two columns changes the determinant sign, the SIGN. We saw that on the check-in where we had to carry the minus sign around. Condition three, multiplying a column by a scalar multiplies the entire determinant by that scalar. So we're reminding ourselves of the conditions, particularly in the context where we've changed them to be uh, uh, stated in terms of columns instead of rows. And then finally, condition four is that the determinant of identity matrix is one. It doesn't speak directly to, to columns or rows, but anyway, that's condition four. Okay, so here's this, this, the central slide here. for the. We're going to argue that the conditions on the determinant function, the ones that we just reminded ourselves on the previous slide, make good axioms for a function giving the size of the box. I calculated the size of the two-dimensional box there a couple of slides ago. We want to argue that the, that the, the conditions, the four conditions that we just went over, give good postulates, give good axioms, good conditions for the function giving the size of a box in Rn. So just as a, for example, take the third condition. Rescaling a column 
rescales the entire determinant. If you take a determinant and multiply one of the columns by k, say by 1.4, then the entire determinant should multiply by 1.4. And look here at the picture. I drew it in two dimensions just because that's easy to draw, but I took the v vector and I rescaled it by multiplying it by 1.4. I think that the area of the enclosed region multiplies by 1.4. I think this box is 1.4 times as big as this box. So if you replace the word DET with SIZE, then I think that a person has some sense that that fits. The first condition. First condition says that if you do some column operation, because we're working with column vectors, first condition says that if you do some column operation, k times v plus w, then you don't change the size of the box. So I drew a box, the same box, drew a box, and then I did a column operation on, uh, I did k times v plus w, and I compared the new box to the old box. And what you see is that, of course, the two boxes are different, but they have the same, same base and the same height, and so they have same area, same size. So condition one also seems to fit our intuition of what sizes of boxes sh should do. Uh, when, after the definition determinant, we noted that the second condition is redundant. It's a consequence of the other th three conditions. So I'm going to leave it aside for the minute and talk about it uh, more in just a second. The final condition in the definite determinant, of course, is that the identity matrix has determinant 1, and we're going to think of it as having size 1, having measure 1, having sort of a component of total of 1. Okay, well, I, I, I mean, there we go. I just made a box out of the two, uh, out of the two, excuse me, the two uh, standard basis vectors, and we expect that to have size 1. I want to make a remark about the second condition because it says something that a, a, a person may find surprising. So the second condition in the definition determinant says that swapping columns, I'm stating in terms of column, changes the size of the determinant. Excuse me, changes the sign of the determinant. Excuse me, I misspoke. So what, 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 wait, size of boxes has a sign, has an, has, has an SIGN, what, 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 what? Okay, so let's look at these two, 4, 2, and 1, 3. So here's 4, 2, see it there? Here's 1, 3, see it there? I drew a little, a little arrow that arcs over from 4, 2 to 1, 3. That's a counterclockwise arrow. And when you calculate the determinant using the usual 2 by 2 determinant formula, you get 10. If you swap those two so that you take the 1, 3 first and the 4, 2 second, now to get from first vector to second vector, the arrow arcs clockwise. Here, to get from first vector to second vector, the arrow arced counterclockwise. Here, to get from first vector, the 1, 3, to second vector, the arrow arced counterclockwise, and I get a minus 10 for the sort of content of that box. So what we're seeing then is that when we take determinant to tell us something about the size of a box, it includes information about kind of how much paint it would take to paint it, 10 square inches. But it also includes information about the orientation or the sense of the box. The first one here is oriented. The, the columns are stated in, in such a way that, that, that to go from U to V, you arc counterclockwise. Here, they, the, uh, the columns are stated in such a way that to go from 1, 3 to 4, 2, you arc clockwise. And we're going to just consider clockwise to be a negative orientation. I mean, we've got to pick one of them to be negative. We're going to pick, going to pick the, the orientation that's written there to give us a negative sense for the box. This orientation thing can sometimes seem a little weird to a person, so I want to do a, a, a three-dimensional picture. And you can see that I got the computer to draw it for me because I'm totally hopeless when it comes to drawing these things. OK. So uh, if I take two vectors, 1, 4, 1, and minus 2, 3, 1, and I drew them there, then they span a plane. That's this yellowish plane. Of course, plane divides three space into two parts, the parts up and the part down. 
and you can see that I drew a V3 up. Ah, it's embarrassing, but I drew a little guy there, a little person on the V3. If you take V3 above the plane, that is, if you take V3 so that V3 is, is on the side of the plane with the following property. A person standing on V3, looking at the arc from V1 to V2, sees that arc as counterclockwise. Looking at the arc from V1 to V2, sees that arc as counterclockwise, then we'll take that to be a positive, positively oriented box. So the box formed by V1, V2, and V3 will be positively oriented. The idea here is that the idea here is that you put your right hand down on the plane. You put your hand on V1 and you curl your pinky finger over to V2. Your thumb points in the direction of V3. If so, then the box, the parallelopiped, formed by these three vectors will have a positive sign. What's the opposite of that? Whoops. There we go. There's the, there's the, can you see that the guy is below the plane and looking up? Below the plane and looking up. If you want to put your hand so that your hand rests on V1, can, can, can you, your hand that rests on V1 and you curl your pinky fingers toward V2 and now you try to do it with your right hand, it won't work, you got to do it with your left hand instead. Now your left hand points in the direction of, uh, so those will be the negatively oriented boxes. So it has to do with right hand and left hand. I'm going to, I, I have a sequence of, to try to help a person picture, and maybe a little goofy sequence, to try to help a person picture what's happening. Now I'm, I'm kind of on the underside and looking up. Here I'm on the overside and looking down. Okay. Okay. So so what's happening here is that if you curl your hand from V1 to V2, then the thumb that points in the direction of V3 is your left hand. So the left hand boxes will will have a minus sign, the right hand boxes will have a plus sign. Okay. So we have so I'm using the word size here, not the word volume because we uh we have a, a sense to the box an orientation to the box. The box are directed in some way. All right, so a uh, couple of consequences of what's happening here is that, uh, the, the first one is that determinants are multiplicative. If you take a transformation from Rn to Rn, it, it will change the size of all boxes by the same factor. So for example, if you change, the, uh, if you have a transformation from Rn to Rn that takes the unit box, the box formed from the unit, uh, from the standard basis, and it, uh, it transforms it to a new box that, that is twice as big, then it transforms every box, no matter what kind of crazy big, small, it, it transforms every box to one that's twice as big. So the, the size of the image box is determinant of t times the size of the box it, S. So T of T of S, that's a box. T of S determinant is determinant of T times the size of the box S. Where T represents capital T represents little t with respect to the standard basis. In short, the determinant of capital T times capital S is equal to the determinant of key, capital T times the determinant of capital S. And and the the proof here is got two cases. So if t is singular and if t is non-singular. Neither one is especially complicated, but but two cases. If t is singular, then it doesn't have an inverse. So uh, I'm going to note that if t s were invertible, then there'd be an m so that t s m equals i. Just move the parentheses to make it t by s m equals i, and so t would be invertible. The contrapositive of that observation is that if t is not invertible, then neither is t s. That is to say, if the determinant of t is 0, t is singular. If the determinant of t is 0, then the determinant of t s must be 0 also. Okay, so a little bit on the, a little bit on the tricky side maybe, but it's right. 
If t is singular, then the determinant of uh, the, then it's the case that if the determinant of t equals zero, then the determinant of t s equals zero also until we have equality. Next case is the that t is non-singular. Any non-singular matrix factors into a product of elementary Gauss's method matrices. To finish the arguments, what I'm just going to do is verify that that the statement works for each elementary matrix and the result will follow just just from the multiplicatively multiplicativeness is that a word okay so there's three types of elementary matrices there's the multiply a row by k there's the permute two rows interchange two rows and there's the uh, k times row i plus row j I'm going to do the first just uh, just because the other two go much the same way and, and so often in the slides we try to give a feel for what's going to happen rather than cover all the details. Okay, so the matrix uh, M, I, K uh, then multiplied by S is e the same as S except that row I is multiplied by K. So this is the product of two matrices and it's, uh, the two matrices are the same except that uh, uh, row I got multiplied by a factor of K. And the third condition of the determinant function then gives that the, um, the determinant of that matrix must be k times the determinant of s. But mik, that matrix, must have a determinant of k, again, by the third condition, because mik is derived from the identity. The definition of mik is that it's derived from the identity matrix by multiplying row i times the factor k. And so we have the uh, multiplicative property in the case where of MIK, and a similar argument gives the multiplicative property in the case of uh, permutation matrices and in the case of row combination matrices. And every non-singular matrix is a, is a is a combination of those three is a uh, factors into a common factors into a product of those three, and so we get uh, we get the result. Okay, so some examples. The transformation that takes R2 to R2 and rotates all vectors count through a counterclockwise angle of theta, especially important 2 by 2 matrix, is represented by this. And just geometrically, if you think in your head what it does, it does this to everybody. So it doesn't change the size of any boxes, it just rotates them. And you'll note that the determinant of T theta is 1 because cosine squared minus a minus sine squared makes cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1. Isn't that nice? The, the linear transformation that's represented with respect to standard basis by this kind of arbitrary matrix, 1, 2, 3, 4, will change the box size of any box that you give it by a factor of minus 2. So, he, so uh, 1 times 4 minus 3 times 2 gives uh, a 4 minus 6 minus 2. So, uh, oops, I spelled is wrong. Oh, no, is S acting on a typical box. No, I didn't. I spelled it right. So I did. It's on the next slide. I didn't fit it on this slide. So here's a box in the plane, and uh, it's got a V1 and a V2. It happens to be the box where V1 is 1, 0, and, and V2 is 1, 1. And I applied S to it, 1, 2, 3, 4. I applied that to the box, and I, I got a new box. It's tall and skinny. Can you see it there? Tall and skinny. There's S of V1 and S of V2. And remember that the determinant is negative. Do you notice that to go from V1 to V2, you go counterclockwise? But to go from S of V1 to S of V2, you go clockwise? So we change not only the size of the box, but we also change the orientation. It went from a counterclockwise orientation to a clockwise orientation. That's why the determinant has a negative sign. This, so this box over here, this box over here has the has the right size. The original box had a size of one. This box here has a size of minus two because that was the determinant of the matrix. The determinant of the inverse. If you tell me the, the if you tell me the determinant of a matrix, I can calculate the determinant of the inverse because it's simply one over. And that follows directly from the previous result is that uh, obviously the identity matrix has a determinant of 1 and obviously the identity matrix is T times T inverse so you split along the minus sign because the previous result says you can split along a minus sign and you get then that the, the determinant of T inverse is 1 over the determinant of T and here's, uh, here's a 2 by 2 example. Again notice the sign, the SIGN, they both 
They both flip the orientation. Volume. So, uh, so we focused on uh, we're focused on size because I wanted to talk about orientation. But a lot of times in applications, you don't want you don't care about the orientation. You only care about the size. So, what's the story with 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 the volume? And the answer is just take the absolute value. That's all. very very straightforward. Just take the absolute value. So, uh, so, so this particular box, for example, to get from v1 to v2, you would go clockwise. If I asked you what is the what is the size of this box, you'd say negative two. But if I asked you what's the volume of the box area for two dimensions, what's the volume of this box, you'd say positive two. You just simply take the absolute value, no more complicated than that. Okay. Okay, uh, so I want to close today by talking about something that is uh, kind of a fun application of, uh, of these area facts um, and uh, often used by people, often people have memorized this particular application, uh, often used by people to, 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 to sort of do things in their head. All right, so I want to give a geometric interpretation of linear systems. So here we go. Uh, I wrote down a not very complicated linear system. 1, 2, 3, 1 are the matrix of coefficients, and uh, 6, 8 is the constants. And I drew a picture here. Here's 2, 1. There we go, 2, 1. Here's 1, 3. There we go, 1, 3. Here's 6, 8 up here, 6, 8. And so in asking what is x1 and x2, I am asking, how much do I multiply 2, 1 by, that is x2, how much do I multiply 2, 1 by? And how much do I multiply 1, 3 by? So that when I add the two, the parallelogram diagram will give me 6, 8. Okay, that's the geometry, what's happening here. I'm asking, what's the x2? What's the x1? So that the parallelogram diagram gives me 6, 8. Okay. All right, so I drew the same, of course. I first drew the parallelogram for 1, 3, and 2, 1. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on x1. x2 works the same way. Multiply 1, 3 by x1, and of course what you get is a, you get a parallelogram that is x1 times as big, and that fills in this portion of the, of the parallelogram from the previous slide. So there we go. If I ask, what's the area of the shaded region? It's the area of this. What's the size of the shaded region? It's this. When I multiply it by x1, the size of the shaded region is this. It's got one side x1 times 1, 3. The other side is 2, 1. And now one of the other conditions in the definition of determinant is that if you do a column operation, you don't affect the size of the, of the parallelogram. Okay, so I'm going to do the column operation that takes x2 times the second column and adds it to the first column. x2 times the second column and adds it to the first column. Okay, so there I go. x2 times the second column added to the first column. Well, we know what x1 times 1, x2 times 2, and x1 times 3, x2 times 1 is. It's 6, 8. So I get this for a parallelogram. The vector on this side is 6, 8. The vector on this side is 2, 1. So I wrote it in, 6, 8, 2, 1. Now compare the beginning of the equation to the end of the equation. In short, I can calculate x1 by taking this over this. It didn't fit on this slide, so here it is on the next slide. Calculate x1 by taking the determinant 6, 8, 2, 1 over the determinant 1, 3, 2, 1. That is to say, to calculate x1, you write down the matrix of coefficients and you replace the, 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 the two coefficients here that are x1's coefficients. You replace them with the constants, the 6, 8. That goes on the top. This is easy to calculate. This is easy to calculate. I get an answer to. Obviously, the same works for x2. I looked at the matrix of coefficients. 1, 3, and 2, 1. I re to get x2's answer, I replace the 2, 1 with 6, 8. Do the calculation, you get a 2. So Kramer's rule is, I'll state it, 
Let A be an n by n matrix with a non-zero determinant, because you don't want to be dividing by zero. Let A be an n by n matrix with a non-zero determinant, and let B be the n tall column vector that, that forms the constants in this linear system. Then for any i, you can figure out xi by writing determinant of bi divided by determinant of a, where bi is the matrix you get by substituting the vector b for column i of a. In other words, if you want to calculate x1, you, you substitute for column 1 the, the column of, of constants. If you want to calculate x2, you substitute for column 2 the column of constants. Okay. Here's a simple example, 3 by 3. I have uh, here a uh, uh, linear system, looks like first day class. Uh, so 2, 1, minus 1, etc. 4, 2, 0 is the, uh, is, are the constants. So uh, if, uh, if I want to worry about here x2, just as an example, I'm going to replace the 1, 3, 1 with the 4, 2, 0. There it is. I replace the 1, 3, 1 with the 4, 2, 0. Find the determinant of the matrix without the replacement and the determinant of the matrix with the replacement and that gives you an answer. One divided by the other gives you the answer. So you can rapidly get x2 if you can calculate these determinants. You can rapidly get x2 or x1 or whatever you want to get. So it's called Kramer's rule and it's a kind of a nice little gadget. But I'll give you a caution. Kramer's rule is interesting and it's a nice application of the geometry. A lot of people have memorized Kramer's rule because it allows you to solve small systems, for example, two, two equations, two unknowns, in your head, if the numbers are small and malleable. But please don't use Kramer's rule for system having 50 variables. If you're looking at a 50 equation, 50 variable system, don't do Kramer's rule because calculating the determinant is, is, is going to be very slow. Instead, just do Gauss's method like on the first day of class. So Kramer's rule is kind of fun, and it illustrates the geometry of what we're doing, but it isn't really the answer that a person should be thinking about. Okay, very good. Kind of a long day today. So uh, next time we're going to come back, and we're, we're actually in a third section here, so, uh, so we're making rapid progress. Okay, bye-bye.